Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, really glad you're with us for the Monday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Uh, we have good, bad, and crazy martinis for you today. It's going to be an interesting week on the podcast. Uh, Jim and I are together today. Uh, and then I am headed out of town, and Chad Benson will be filling in for me the next couple days. And then uh, you'll have Jim and me back together uh, with some special episodes of the Three Martini Lunch. So we're both uh, traveling, but we want to make sure that you are taken care of with the best coverage on the Three Martini Lunch this week. So uh, definitely don't miss an episode uh, the rest of the week. So, Jim, let's dive right in with our good martini. And once again, despite the best efforts of the news media, the American people are seeing quite clearly uh, exactly what kind of performance Joe Biden is putting in as president. The latest evidence comes to us from an NBC News poll uh, showing that Biden is at his lowest approval rating for that poll at 40 percent. Others have had him in the 30s, but for the NBC poll, he's at 40 percent, down from 43 percent in January, uh, while the number of disapproving voters has increased to 55 percent. Um, this is uh, also showing that among black respondents, his approval rating is at 62 percent. Also, the president's approval among Latinos, we've documented this before, down nine points from January to 39 percent. It's also dropped four points among independents, down to 32 percent. They show Republicans with just a two-point lead on the generic ballot, but if you look at all the other demographics, it's hard to imagine that that's going to be how that plays out. Biden's only at 33 percent approval rating on the economy. 38 percent blame the president for rising inflation, which hit 7.9 percent in February. Only 28 percent of respondents, Jim, said they have either a great deal or quite a bit of confidence in Biden's handling of the Russia-Ukraine crisis. And a whopping 44 percent said they have very little confidence in the president. So, uh, like we've said before, we don't have a lot of demographics and we don't have a lot of issues where the people have any confidence in this president right now. And roughly half the country is saying, see, I told you so right now. By the way, for listeners, Greg walked through all of the uh, complications to our schedule for this week. I know it might seem like you've accidentally hit on a rerun. Oh, Jim and Greg are talking about Biden's poll numbers being down again. This must be from last week or last <laughs> month or the month before that. No, no, it's this is this is a new one. This is March 28th, 2022. It just happens to be even more bad news for Biden. And I think there are two things that uh, jump out of the accumulation of continuing lousy polls. The first is that we're not directly in the Russia-Ukraine war, but clearly the administration is on one side. We're attempting to arm the Ukrainians. Uh, we certainly feel like we have a vested interest in the outcome of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and oftentimes the president gets a rally around the flag effect when there's the beginning of, of you know, military combat. That does not really appear to be happening here. Um, and I think that uh, most Americans, or we'll, we'll talk a bit more in this next martini, uh, as Greg laid out, they don't have confidence in his ability to handle this crisis. They're not feeling reassured. Um, there's no indication that the Russia-Ukraine crisis is going to be how President Biden improves his numbers between now and the midterms. And the second thing that I think doesn't get nearly uh, enough attention is that obviously, you know, here it is late March. Very few Americans out there are still wearing masks. Very few things are shut down. Unless you live in Shanghai, you probably feel like the COVID-19 pandemic is finally over. It's finally in your rearview mirror. You can travel again. You can go about. You can live your lives. You can get together in big groups. You know, it's all behind you. Joe Biden famously promised, I'm not going to shut down the country. I'm not going to shut down the economy. I'm going to shut down the virus. And of course, he did not shut down the virus. There was no button in the Oval Office that Donald Trump was refusing to press saying shut down the virus, right? It took a long, messy year and change for the COVID-19 pandemic to end. I think most notably, you know, the Omicron came along. Everybody got it. Now everybody's got a certain amount of natural immunity for it. And that's what ended the pandemic, not any particular administration policy. As a result of this, we don't have COVID-19 in our lives. We still have all kinds of problems in our lives. High inflation, high food prices, high gas prices, crisis at the border. Uh, you know, just a general sense of, of Washington being typically dysfunctional and unresponsive to people's problems. And so obviously solving the, you know, the end, COVID-19 is going away, but Biden's numbers are not improving. And so that's interesting. You might have thought, oh, OK, well, that pro even though he didn't solve it, as people stop thinking about COVID-19, maybe Biden's numbers will go up. Well, no, they won't, because now they're really thinking about gas prices, inflation, and all these other things. So um, I think if, if Biden wants to see his poll numbers go up, the condition of the country has to get tangibly better, particularly in those areas I mentioned. And it's going to 
unlikely to change between now and uh, November 20 of this year. No, that's exactly right. And the reason it's a good martini is because, like as I said at the beginning, the American people are seeing this clearly. We're obviously conservatives. We're not a fan of this president's policies by and large. We don't want a failed presidency, but uh, the fact that uh, he is flailing around on every issue is critical. And uh, if we just look the other way, things are only going to get worse. The best way to get better is to, to identify these things, call them out, and hopefully elect people who can steer this country in a better direction. So it's not that we want the country to suffer. It's that we want better leadership. All right, Jim, uh, we, like you said, we'll talk about some of Biden's problems overseas in the next martini. But for now, you can kick back and relax in the amazing comfort of your ex chair. From the first moment I sat in my ex chair, my body immediately said, ah, so this is what a real office chair is supposed to feel like. I never actually looked forward to sitting in my office until I got my ex chair. Now, can your current office chair give you a massage while you're working? My ex chair can. Can your current office chair heat up or cool down? My ex chair can do that too. It's all in the Elamax Massage and Temperature Regulation, which is exclusively designed and made for X-Chair. And once you feel the customized support of the X-Chair's patented Dynamic Variable Lumbar, or DVL, your back will never be happy in any other chair again. High performance, quality engineering, and extreme comfort. Those are all the reasons I love my X-Chair. Now I can't wait to be at work, and sometimes, even if I'm not working, I sit in my X-Chair just to get that feeling. Take my advice. Try the X-Chair for yourself, risk-free for 30 days. Once you realize how much better your chair should be, you'll never go back, I promise. So go to xchairmartini.com right now. That's the letter X, chair, M-A-R-T-I-N-I.com. Or call 1-844-4X-CHAIR for $100 off your order. X-Chair has a 30-day guarantee of complete comfort, and you can finance your purchase for as little as $30 per month. One more time, xchairmartini.com. All right, Jim, on to the bad martini now. And President Biden was in Europe for much of last week, spoke publicly a number of times. At some, certain points, he uh, had some good things to say. Uh, there were some nice statements about uh, freedom and democracy in his speech uh, in Poland uh, at, towards the end of the week. But it's the gaffes. Just like, you know, remember when Mitt Romney took that uh, tour in Europe uh, back in 2012? What about your gas? <laughs> yes, <laughs> the, the melodic the... tones of the press corps following. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it didn't seem to happen this time, although that was clarified outside of uh, his church in Georgetown on uh, on Sunday. But nonetheless, three different moments that uh, the White House Communications Office which is kind of understaffed right now because their top two officials have COVID, uh, that they really had to try to play cleanup, including from that massive speech uh, in Poland uh, at the end of the week. So here's a montage of Biden's gaffes and reporters or administration officials trying to clean them up, including Phil Mattingly of CNN, Peter Ducey of Fox News, and uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. For God's sake, this man cannot remain Power. The White House trying to make clear in the aftermath, or making very clear in the aftermath, he was not, in fact, calling for regime change. And you're going to see when you're there, and you've, some, some of you have been there, you're going to see, you're going to see women, young people, stand on, stand in the middle of the front of a damn tank. White House officials are telling us that President Biden does not intend to send U.S. troops into Ukraine. If chemical weapons were used in Ukraine, would that trigger a military response from NATO? It would trigger a response in kind. The United States has no intention of using chemical weapons, period, under any circumstance. Jim, I mean, from Putin can't stay in power to telling the troops what they're going to see in Ukraine uh, to chemical weapons uh, response in kind. And then I had to clean all of that up. And as you point out uh, in detail in the morning jolt today, uh, it's one thing if the president can't remember somebody who's on the stage with him at some uh, you know nice event at the White House. It's another thing when he's just dropping these things all over in the middle of a national security crisis. Yeah, this is, you know, sadly predictable. Joe Biden has never been the most verbally disciplined guy. And of course, he ran for president in 2020 by saying a president's words matter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and that's why we're in such deep doo-doo at this moment. I, I will grant by recognizing that this is a difficult foreign policy challenge and that the president or you know, any U.S. president in this situation would have to walk a tightrope. Right. You want to observe that we are vehemently opposed to what Russia is doing. And I think it's fairly clear for four straight presidencies, Putin has been behaving as if he was 
uh, if you know, if you want to use the term an enemy of the United States, then an implacably hostile to U.S. interests and uh, to peace and stability in the world and to freedom and blocking us at the U.N. Going back to Mitt Romney, Russia is our, our preeminent geopolitical foe. And of course, Obama said, oh, the 80s called. They're looking for their foreign policy back. That having been said, we don't want to start World War III. We do not want to get sucked directly into a, the Ukraine-Russia conflict as a combatant. Uh, we're going right up to that line, literally and metaphorically, by giving them uh, weapons and things like that. And this is just not something where you can wing it and, and just, you know, say things off the cuff. And so today's morning jolt, I lay, of course, we all relate to what Biden said. Of course, we all be perfectly happy if, you know, Vladimir Putin either, you know, uh, had a heart attack tomorrow or, or had a accidentally got served some of his own polonium soup or, you know, secure somebody in a security detail. Yeah, of course, we'd rather if he you know, struck by lightning. However, you want Vladimir Putin to depart this earth. We'd be perfectly happy if it happened tomorrow. Um, by the way, if you've read the, some of my writings over the last couple of weeks, there's a lot of reasons to think that, look, the, the, the prime minister takes over, they're supposed to have a, an election in 90 days. In the long term, we should not expect subsequent Russian leaders to see the world all that differently from Putin. It's just kind of baked in the cake if this is what a Russian leader does. They, they want to see Europe, uh, Eastern Europe as a sphere of influence. Might be less reckless, might be less provocative, but you're probably not going to see things dramatically different. But, uh, you know, if you want to say we want to have regime change, then then go ahead, then, then say oh, the, the purpose, the, our long term aim is a change in the government of Russia. I think you're biting off a lot, if maybe not more, maybe more than this country can chew. I do think, uh, as my colleague Kevin Williamson argued, we may eventually have the opportunity to push for a, you know, if not completely denuclearized Russia. And a Russia will need our help in rebuilding from the economic devastation that our sanctions are inflicting. And we could very easily say, hey, you know what? We can make all this go away tomorrow. We can go back to regular trade. We can go back to buying your oil and gas. We will be perfectly happy to treat you like a normal country. All we ask is that you give up some high percentage of your nuclear stockpile, and maybe you can make the world a slightly safer place if they go down that path. I, you know, that's probably the most optimistic scenario I can see coming out of this. If you don't, if you don't want to go to that path of we are trying to change the government of, of Russia, they will have to be in a situation where you can continue to make a deal with Russia and then with Vladimir Putin and calling him a war criminal and calling him a butcher and things like that, like Biden has said, makes that outcome much tougher. Oh, by the way, I don't expect this is going to be a huge game changer in terms of U.S.-Russia relations. But Putin has always believed the U.S. is out to get him. Biden coming out and saying he can't stay in power is basically affirming all of Putin's paranoia. Um, this is going to be replaying on Russian state television for weeks, maybe even months and years. Like this is this is just handing Putin exactly what he needed to say to his people. See, NATO is out to get us. They're out to get me. They, they hate Russia. Yada, yada, yada. So you have two options here. Neither one of them are particularly good. Both of them are really difficult. But your job as a leader is to pick one. You can either want regime change or you can not have regime change. And right now, we have Schrodinger's foreign policy. We both want regime change and we don't want regime change at the exact same time. Well, when you try to do two contradictory goals at once, you usually end up doing nothing. You usually end up going, you know, not accomplishing neither one of them because your messages are contradictory. Biden now looks weak to his allies. He now looks, he's given Putin this huge advantage and Putin now thinks he really is out to get him. And everybody else who wasn't already on Biden's side is confused by what our policy actually is. You should not be winging it off the cuff in foreign policy. Biden did it. And I think it complicated the road towards ending the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, because, you know, for Putin's mind, point, of, point of view, why should he give up anything? Why shouldn't he fight to the bitter end? Because the U.S. wants him out of power anyway. But we're going to trust this butcher to uh, negotiate the Iran nuclear deal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, just checking, just checking. All right, if that doesn't make any sense, and doesn't, uh, let's take a nap. Uh, my pillow, best stuff for that. Uh, great pillows, great sheets, great mattress toppers, great slippers, and also the phenomenal towels. And right now, those phenomenal towels are available at a great deal. The six-piece towel set, regularly $109.99, now available for just $39.99 a set. The MyPillow six-piece towel set is made with cotton grown right here in the United States. Now, you might have seen other towels where they feel good, but they don't absorb very well, or they absorb very well, but they don't feel good. Well, every MyPillow towel is made from a proprietary technology that makes them highly absorbent and soft to the touch. There's none of that lotion-y feel, and every set comes with two bath towels, two hand towels, two washcloths. The MyPillow six-piece towel set is available in a variety of colors and sizes. They're machine washable, and they come with a 60-day money-back guarantee. 
and a one-year limited warranty. For a limited time, get the MyPillow six-piece towel set, regularly $109.99 for only $39.99 with the promo code MARTINI. Visit MyPillow.com slash Martini or call 800-874-0104. You'll also find deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including the MyPillow mattress topper, MyPillow Giza Dream Sheets, and so much more. Get your six-piece MyPillow towel set for only $39.99 today at MyPillow.com slash Martini or by calling 800-874-0104. MyPillow.com slash Martini. All right, Jim. It was just last week where we had story after story. Is a time that would just get rid of the Oscars. Do they even serve a purpose anymore. Nobody's watching. The number's way, way, way down the last couple of years, possibly due to the COVID arrangements and, and so forth. But for the most part, uh, you know, people just losing interest. Uh, niche films that nobody watches are kind of the ones that seem to get nominated all the time now. Uh, but last night, Twitter was a buzz because Will Smith slugged Chris Rock in the face for talking about his wife Jada Pinkett's hair. Jada, I love you. G.I. Jane 2, can't wait to see it. All right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, that, was a, that was a nice one. Okay. I'm out here. Uh-oh. Richard. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Will Smith just smacked the shit out of me. The Wow, dude. Yes. It was a G.I. Jane joke. Keep my wife's name out your mouth. I'm going to, okay? Jim, for the longest time, I thought this was staged because, uh, first of all, Will Smith laughed at the joke. <laughs> he laughed at the joke. He's laughing hard at it. And then all of a sudden something changed because I think Jada was not laughing at the joke. And then it seemed like Chris Rock recovered pretty quickly from getting smacked across the face in what seemed like a fairly hard manner. But then it was very awkward. And Will Smith apologized when he also won for Best Actor, which made for a crazy evening. So ugly all the way around. And of course, uh, America's more than happy to get sucked into this story <laughs> for 24 hours rather than things, you know, like the border, uh, the war and you know other stuff that we try to call attention to on a daily basis. Yeah, I, I don't. I'm actually not going to begrudge people too much, even though I, I cracked a joke about it at the beginning of today's Morning Jolt, because, look, Will Smith is a huge star. Chris Rock is a huge star. A lot of people like both of them. And so when you see two guys getting up and, you know, the beginning of a you know physical altercation, what could have been a fist fight, uh, you know, people are pretty shocked by it. You could have heard a pin drop in that room uh, for a stretch there. And I've been fascinated to see the response amongst my conservative brethren. A lot of interesting chats on the National Review Slack this morning. I think, Mike, and you, Greg, you and I have not talked about this before our podcast. I'm very curious about your take on this. I am struck by how out of step I feel with a lot of people I am usually absolutely in step with. So my colleague, Phil Klein, I think made the best, most persuasive indictment of Will Smith. But no matter how offended he was by Chris Rock's joke or how outraged he was that, you know, Jada's feelings were hurt. When you're one of Hollywood's biggest stars, part of the price of fame is that people are going to make jokes about you and, or your wife. And you're not going to like those jokes, but you have to kind of grin and bear it and just live with it because that's part of it. If you, It's the Oscars. It's not some guy at a bar coming up and, make, you know, and giving your wife grief. If you can't deal with someone cracking a joke about your wife, don't show up for the ceremony. And now you know this is coming. With that said, Right. I think it's pretty obvious. Chris Rock thought he was just offering the usual garden variety. Oh, what a bad haircut joke about Jada Pinkett Smith. It turns out she has alopecia, a condition that causes hair loss. Uh, she revealed it in 2018, but I think it's entirely possible Rock never heard about it. I had never heard about it. Most people seem to have not heard about it until last night. Now, Greg, I have no idea how you come down on this, but I have a feeling if you mock a man's wife in his presence, in my mind, you're signing a waiver for whatever comes next. <laughs> some men are going to be cool with it and laugh it off. Some men are going to get in your face and get angry. And some men will go will want to beat the snot out of you. And I'm saying it was a Jim Croce song, Don't Tug on Superman's Cape, Don't Spit into the Wind. And yes, the song's chorus is Don't Mess Around with Jim, which is one of the reasons I've liked it. But, you know, if you are, don't want to run the risk of dealing with a furious husband, don't make fun of his wife unless you're 110% sure he's going to be cool with it. If it was just she had a bad haircut and he was making fun of a haircut, okay, you know, Will Smith, you know, chill out, relax. It's, you know, it's one joke. 
the fact that it's because of a, a a disease that she has, I think, puts it into murkier waters, and I think probably explains why she was offended so much and why Smith reacted so strongly. Uh, I think, as I, I put it to a couple of my colleagues this morning, it, Chris Rock had joked about somebody being bald because they were going through chemotherapy. <laughs> Lots of folks would have said, "Oh no, you go up, you slap him, you kick his butt, you put you know put the fear of God into him or something like that." And first of all, I don't think Chris Rock would do that sort of thing. So what we have here is a big misunderstanding. Chris Rock thinks he's making a usual uh, haircut joke, and you can kind of hear it when he says, it was a joke about G.I. Jane. You know, he's just shocked that Will Smith is so angry about it, and Will Smith is so angry about it, and I assume because, you know, Jada Pinkett Smith's feelings are very hurt by it, and I think it's because Jada Pinkett Smith feels like her, her condition is making her the butt of the joke. And so Rock didn't know he crossed the line. Smith totally lost his cool, and you had this. Now, here's the thing. They're both, according to the you know famous diplomat Sean P. Diddy Combs, uh, they're both getting. They've worked it out. They're doing fine. These are two very rich celebrities. Are two very successful guys. You know, it'll be an infamous moment in their careers, but I think everything's fine. Chris Rock definitely kept his cool, and I think everyone's going to move on from this. But I kind of have. I, I just have like I'm surprised how much I'm seeing people utterly denounce Will Smith when. And again, it's a lot of it is probably context dependent. All I'm just saying is that, like, you know, uh, no one has ever given Mrs. Garrity any grief about and this kind of stuff. And she has, but she has seen me flip out when I've seen uh, people, you know, treat what in my mind, treat her badly. So Will Smith, I feel you. You probably shouldn't have done that. But I let's just say I know where you're coming. As you know, ironically, I'm going to quote Chris Rock. I'm not saying OJ should have done it, but I understand. Chris, you know, Will Smith, I understand. Yeah, he's a dirtbag. Uh, I, I got to say that. Uh, I can right. I, I can obviously... Uh, Appreciate him being offended over his wife's honor, but he laughed at the joke. He thought it was funny. It's only when she didn't that he leaped into action, which is the main reason I thought it was an act. And so, I mean, if you want to shout him out, if you want to track him down at the after party, uh, that's one thing. But if it was not an act and he just flipped off the handle like that, you know, a lot of people are pointing out, what does he do in real life when he gets angry? Does he do this to everybody? Does he do it to his own family? Who knows? Uh, I don't know. I'm not going to punch that alien in Independence Day. <laughs> I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. Let's just say their marriage is unusual. Yes, it's <laughs> a lot of people are pointing that out this morning. Yeah, a lot of people are involved in that marriage, as it turns out. But uh, <laughs> nonetheless, uh, there are no heroes here. I. We'll hope it goes away. I hope it's a 24 to 48 hour story and everybody gets on with their life. I feel bad that uh, other people uh, got overshadowed last night, including the Best Picture winner. But in the end, I don't think it affects either one of their careers. I think Chris Rock's jaw is going to be fine. And I'm guessing Will Smith probably won't lose too many contracts and the rest of us shouldn't lose any sleep. That's a good way of summarizing it. And yeah, yeah, I've been thinking about, you know, a lot of people are speculating this is a form of overcompensation for a uh, marriage that, as you said, has been very non-traditional there. So anyway, but hey, you know what? Um, the, the Oscars said they wanted to generate more buzz. <laughs> well, they got one. <laughs> they got it. Oh, somebody was saying they're going to co-host next year, which would not surprise ah, me. I, I want to see a wacky buddy cop film. If the uh, goal of celebrities is to get attention, they got attention. Jim, have a good day, and uh, I'll see you on those specials later in the week and uh, back for another regular edition next week. I will see you non-specifically later, Greg. <laughs> Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. We invite you to subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. Tell your friends about us as well. Thank you so much for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. They are a big help to us. Also, uh, follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Monday, and please tune in again on Tuesday for the next Three Martini Lunch. Former Delta Force Commander Jerry Boykin joins us to discuss the left's Marxist assault on our nation. I'm Sarah Carter. On the latest Sarah Carter Show, General Boykin also addresses President Biden's string of gaffes on his trip to Europe. I'll also share some of my amazing trip to the border last week and react to the news that the border crisis is expected to get even worse. Follow the Sarah Carter Show at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.